Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm Bob DeMarco. On this edition of the show, I'm speaking with Luke LaFontaine. Now, when I told my wife I'll be talking with a stuntman on the podcast, she said, that's really cool. When I said he's a fight choreographer, a stunt coordinator in Hollywood, she said, that's really cool. And then I said, he's also an expert in Japanese and European swordsmanship and ancient weaponry and design swords for cold steel. And she looked at me and she said, uh, what is this guy, your spirit animal? <laughs> and I said, uh, yes, if by spirit animal, you mean someone who embodies a mastery of skill and talents that I admire greatly, then yes. We can call him that. Luke can be seen or not in front of and behind the camera on countless film and television productions. But for you knife junkies, uh, you're seeing him in new video focus series on Cold Steel. Uh, they are calling the deadliest weapons uh, for the historical take on the weapons uh, they design there. I really look forward to catching up with Mr. LaFontaine. But first, uh, be sure to like, comment, subscribe, hit the notification bell and download the show wherever you listen to podcasts. You can also join us on Patreon where you get bonus knife content, like a little bit extra from this interview tonight and other interviews, uh, monthly knife giveaways, et cetera, et cetera. Quickest way to do this is to go to the knifejunkie.com slash Patreon and sign up. Again, that's the knifejunkie.com slash Patreon. The Get Upside app is your way to get cash back on your gas purchases. Get Upside is an app you put on your smartphone, and whenever you need to get gas, search your area for savings, claim your discount, fill up your tank, and then take a picture of the receipt with your phone. And that's it. You've just got cash back. Visit theknifejunkie.com forward slash save on gas to get the app and start saving. Again, that's theknifejunkie.com slash save on gas. Hey, Luke, welcome to the show. Hey there, good to, have, good to see you. Good to be here. Oh, good. Well, you know, uh, I read uh, some of the things you do or are known for, uh, but there's a lot more. Um, you're a second unit director, assistant director. You do a lot of things um, it, outside of the knife world. But I think, I think how people know you initially is your love and mastery of blades. Where did that all start? Where'd that come from? Oh boy, God, I was tiny. Um, uh, my father worked in museums when I was a child. And my father had a job um, helping design exhibits at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, where I grew up. Um, and uh, he knew from a very young age that I had a fascination with swords and weaponry and knights and armor. And so he'd have to take me to work with them sometimes. And they would eventually, inevitably, get the report over the radio saying, Mr. LaFontaine, can you please come downstairs and get your son off of the night's exhibit in the main hall? He's done it again. And sure enough, they'd come down and I'd gone under the ropes and was trying to climb up onto the back of the horse with the Knights and Armor exhibit. Um, they didn't know what to do with me, so they stuck, my dad stuck me in with the guys in the arm and ar arms and armor department at the Met. Mm. And I was mentored by a gentleman by the name of Robert Carroll. And Robert was a genius at uh, antique weapons. He primarily was an expert in ancient firearms, match locks, splint locks, wheel locks. Um, but he knew that I was enamored with swords. So he had other gentlemen within the arms and armor department start to tutor me and take me through all of the, the dark corners of the actual arms and arm uh, room so that he had open drawers and they'd show me things and they'd start quizzing me. And after about a year and a half, uh, they would randomly open a drawer and say, you know, what's in there? And I'd say, well, that's a 14th century Italian broadsword. That is a rapier. That's a messer. That's a Negroli small Italian shield. And they'd kind of roll their eyes and go, oh, my God, he's actually learning all this stuff. <laughs> and then from there, uh, it just, you know, compounded itself. Um, I started studying fencing at around 10 years old. Um, by 11 years old, I was trying to get into doing kendo. Um, and I just 
everything swords and bladed arts and, and knives and swords. Um, I would read books. My father uh, had access to hundreds of books. So um, I was reading Richard Burton. Um, I was reading, uh, getting to look at actual sword treatises. So by the time I reached my teen years, um, I had amassed a bunch of knowledge and was still uh, daily practicing swordsmanship of, you know, various arts where I could and where I could afford to go and train at that age. I mean, it sounds like you had the education that every boy dreams of, you know, walking, um, <clears throat> you know, a, a life lived in the arms and armor department at the Met. So I lived in New York City for a while. And one of the inexpensive things I could do was go to the Met uh, for lots of reasons. I love to look at lots of different art, but I always ended the visit in the arms and armor because that's what I wanted the whole time. And uh, the Japanese swords they have there are beautiful. Then they have, I mean, they have all sorts of, I mean, the fact that you grew up in that is pretty amazing. Uh, how did you, how did you, I mean, just from a love of that, is that how you started in the martial arts? Um, yeah, I, I have to admit, I think that's what did it. Um, I, I started taking a class in Aikijutsu at the age of nine. And um, in taking that class, I realized that I had a profound interest and that I wanted to extend you know, my, my knowledge and what I could learn. So again, I went into fencing, I went into kendo. Um, I joined a, uh, karate dojo in New York, um, that was actually, um, recommended to me by Bill Superfoot Wallace. Hmm. And, um, uh, on the other side of things with my mother, I was very fortunate because my mother worked for sports illustrated magazine. Oh, wow. And it just so happened that she got put in charge of the martial arts scene for the magazine because they didn't do a lot of coverage on martial arts in Sports Illustrated. But they said, well, if we ever do, we're going to put you in charge of it. My mother came to me and went, I don't know anything about martial arts. You've been studying for years now. So I had to sort of be her wingman and go to all these events and meet all these famous martial artists. So um, I got lucky in that aspect as well because it really broadened who I met in the martial arts world at a very young age. Like I said, uh, my first karate dojo was recommended to me by Bill Superfoot Wallace, who was a kickboxing champion and a martial arts legend, um, as well as being able to meet Chuck Norris, um, Keith Vitale, Joe Corley, and a bunch of other martial artists of the time. And so having access to these things, I took full advantage and studied with anyone that I could. And it was a, it was a daily, weekly, monthly practice for me. I, I, I really became absorbed and, um, was studying all the time. And, uh, I still study to this day. I'm still studying, uh, numerous arts because the way I feel you never get it done. You never stop learning. Um, you're always a student. So, um, I was very fortunate with, you know, lucky things in my upbringing that I was able to take advantage of um, amassing knowledge from great people. And I wasn't shy about it. I jumped on every opportunity. So um, all the way across the spectrum, uh, I found that this was one of my primary loves um, in terms of wanting to learn as much as I could. And then that immediately wound up translating over into the fact that the other thing that I love was movies. Mm -hmm. I was a movie nut. I was a movie junkie. I grew up as a kid, you know, sneaking into the movie theater all the time. Um, all the grindhouse theaters in Manhattan in the seventies and early eighties, I was at every single one of them. Um, so when those two worlds combined, uh, it wound up uh, creating a career for me. And it just expanded because I found that I was still, I was still working in every aspect of it. I was still being asked about bladed weapons. I was still being asked about sword play, and I was, and then I was added on to by being asked about stunts and fight choreography and things like that, working in movies. 
Well, how did it how did it actually start? You know, you're going to martial arts classes all the time and grindhouse movies all the time. Um, but there are lots of us who've done that. <laughs> uh, but but you made that transition into actually making it your life. How is it that that happened? Um, funny story. Uh, I went to high school with a son of a famous director. And I didn't really know that his dad was a famous director. He was just one of my buddies in, in, in grade school and high school. And he came to me one day in high school and was jumping up and down and said, my dad, my dad, my dad's going to make this karate picture. you got to be in it. And I said, uh, okay. And he goes, well, look, I've been watching you and you're really good at martial arts and you're amazing and all that stuff. And this is a karate movie. So I told my dad about you and, and, and you're going to be in the movie. And I said, okay. And I met with his dad and suddenly realized that, wait a minute, your dad is John G. Avelson, the director of Rocky and tons of other famous wow. movies. And the karate movie he'd been talking about was The Karate Kid. Wow. And that wound up being my first foray into the film industry. And uh, I got brought out to California and uh, through, went through a bunch of rigmarole because I was underage. And um, they had stuck me in the film and had given me a part. And I was actually going to fight Ralph Macchio. And the social worker came on set and lost her mind and said, you're <laughs> underage, you can't. And the, the, the second unit director, I'm not second unit director, the second AD, Randy Sabusawa, had to sign on as my adult guardian. And I wound up uh, still working in the picture. And um, meeting Pat Johnson, the, the stunt coordinator, and, and everyone else working on the movie. And I was fortunate enough, and Mr. Johnson was, was gracious enough to actually allow this underage kid to do background fights with the Cobra Kai. And John had stuck me in some other scenes. So uh, that wound up being my first foray into the film industry. And... Um, after that, I, I finished high school. Um, I was originally putting my focus on being a commercial artist. So I had geared a lot of my school studies towards commercial art. And so I wound up going to college uh, as an art major and a film minor. Mm. While in college, I got another phone call. Hey, John's doing Rocky Five down in Philadelphia bang i literally bail like some kind of bad college film i bail on a semester and just run down to philadelphia and wind up hanging out on the set of rocky five for a month trying wow. to get on the picture um that was a, a an event all in itself but bottom line i i wound up getting you know tiny bit things in the movie and 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 meeting people and then the turning point was when I got back home and I got back to college, I said, you know what? I don't want to do this. I want to work in movies. I want to work in film. I, I can tell that that's where my real passion is. I've been doing all these things. Everything else that I've studied is all physical stuff. It's all action. It's all martial arts. Why wouldn't I want to go do this? And mm. I hurried up with my college studies, graduated college, and within two weeks I had packed a big duffel bag and stuffed $700 in my pocket and was off to a new life in California. And that's how it all started. <laughs> I mean, I could, I could see pressure. I mean, I'm, I'm not suggesting there was in your case, but I could see you feeling pressure if you have, you know, an academic father and a mother in the corporate world uh, to not do that kind of thing. You know what I mean? I could, I could see the pressure to not, not become a stunt man uh you know um at least uh i i could i could see you know uh, you oh, know there, what i'm saying no, there was definitely I, i'm not gonna lie there were definitely a bunch of after dinner conversations there was a bunch of are you sure and okay and yeah. there were a lot of conversations about it but the, the bottom line was i had completed my studies i got my degree um, I graduated college and I had a degree now and the degree, oddly enough, the degree wound up serving me as well because that came back into play when I had 
entrenched myself in the industry, I wound up, um, you know, doing movie poster designs and storyboards and character sketches. I, I, I absolutely, in the, the range of my career, have used on multiple occasions, uh, you know, the degree I have in art um, to help me in, in my line of work. Oh, I could see that. Uh, I think the ability to draw is similar to uh, having a law degree, not not in any way other than it can serve you in a universal way. Um, yes. the, the ability to draw, the ability to express yourself with pictures. I think I think that's uh, what we are primally. I think um, I think words come later. And uh, if you can express yourself with pictures, I, I agree with you. Um, uh, so how is it that uh, so you're you you start you move out there you've had uh, a taste of some movie productions but this is coming off of years of being a movie junkie what was it like going from being a an observer and a, and a consumer of the movies to being in it and seeing the process seeing how the sausage is made um i gotta tell you oddly it was fairly smooth because my intuition about how movies were made a number of assumptions that i had made were correct you know i knew that people weren't really kicking and punching each other um i knew that it was movie magic and so um when i got to la uh i literally hit the ground running um you know i was out every day at 5 a.m um trying to make connections going to meetings trying to go to auditions um and things started happening for me very, very quickly. And so um, when I got my first few beginning jobs in Hollywood, and they, they were they were smaller jobs, um, but it gave me a chance to really absorb the film set and the process and watch what I was correct about and what there was that I still needed to learn. And I just soaked it all up immediately. So. It was a. It was definitely. It still had the dream come true, Hollywood land, amazing, um, all the sparkle and the glitz, and 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 realizing your dream. That was definitely there, and I was, you know, that was an incredible experience. But the work side of it, um, I got to work very quickly because one of the things that I had been doing, ever since the experience on Karate Kid, I had been modifying all of my martial arts for film. Mm -hmm. So I'd understood, okay, you can't just be a martial artist. You can, you can, you know, spar with five guys and whoop all of them, but that has nothing to do with movie making. So I very quickly started gearing all of my martial arts towards film. I started stylizing my kicks. I started looking in the mirror and going, oh, that looks cool. That looks goofy. That's believable. That's not. And so by the time I had my first couple of jobs, um, two of them were acting jobs and one of them was a pseudo stunt job. And it, it, it came about easily. You know, when I was talking to the stunt coordinator and he was telling me what to do and I would go through rehearsals and he was like, wow, kid, you know, you picked this up really quick. And, um, you know, I kind of explained to him and he says, oh, well, he goes, you definitely get it. And so those first experiences went really smoothly. And, um, a bunch of my friends, uh, in town were giving me grief because they were sitting there going, well, how is it that things are happening for you and you're getting these jobs? And, and I said, oh, I'm going to explain it really easily. I said, by the time you guys have gotten up, gotten your things together and gone to your first audition, I've already been to five. So the early bird gets the worm. You guys don't, we don't have the same drive and you know, hopefully you guys get it. Hopefully you understand, you know, what it takes. But that's the only tidbit I can give you is that I'm there four hours before you guys and I'm working harder, running faster, moving faster and trying to get a lot more done in my day than you guys are. So take that as a tidbit. Hope it helps you. And um, I just started uh, making more and more connections, finding more people to train with because there's no... There's no secret to how you you get in the industry. There's a joke that we used to pass around back in the days of like, 
you know, I could tell you, but then I'd have to kill you. It's a big secret. You know, I'm not going to tell yeah. you the secret lore of how to become a stuntman. But I mean, there, there was no, you didn't go to a stunt school. You know, you didn't sit there and go, I'm going to pay $199.95 and they're going to give you a certificate and tell you you're a stuntman. It didn't work like that. You had to, you had to meet people, train under them, go move and haul and stunt equipment and stunt pads for days, mm -hmm. uh, get muddy, get dirty, climb up and down things, uh, go and grab the stunt coordinator coffee, do whatever it took. You know, and then at some point during the day, he'd say, do you know how to do this? I would say, no, sir, I don't. He'd say, all right, come over here. I'm going to show you. And I would get my tidbit for the day. And he would drop a little wisdom on me. And I would learn how to do a punch combo better for camera. Or I would learn how to get thrown into a bunch of barrels. Or I would learn what the best angle for doing whatever stunt it was. What's the best camera angle? Where to show yourself off so that you make sure that they see what you're doing and you're not doing the gag for no reason. Mm -hmm. um, that mm -hmm. just slowly progressed. And, you know, I, I, I wound up working on films like Hook mm -hmm. and Army of Darkness um, and uh, numbers of television shows. And um, it just very quickly got a life of its own because I was training all day long. So I was living stunts, you know, 26 hours a day. Uh, I literally was, you know, sleeping, eating and breathing it. So I would get up at five in the morning and I was already on to who was I going to go see? Who was I going to train with? What movie sets could I go to? Who could I try and go and hustle up for a job? Um, back in those days, uh, it was kind of like this beautiful last remnant of the heydays of Hollywood where you had 12 movie productions going on all over town. So at one point you'd go downtown L.A., hustle one set, they'd go, yeah, sure, kid, I got a job for you. They'd bring you on and put on this ninja outfit. And you'd get dressed <laughs> as ninja. You'd do a six-minute sword fight and get kicked through a window. And he'd say, oh, well, you're done. I don't have anything else for you to do. And I'd say, well, you want me to move pads? And I'd, I'd move some equipment for him. And, you know, it'd be done. He'd say, no, it's okay. You're wrapped. You can go. And I would jump off that set and run across town and find another movie set. And be there, and they'd say, yeah, you know what? I'm short a guy. Boom. Go get in that car. Go be the passenger of that cop car. And get in the cop car, and we'd race all over the set. And, you know, fire blank guns out the windows and chase people and get into car chases. And, uh, you know, go back and change my wardrobe and put a hat and sunglasses on. And, you know, run out of a bank and get shot. <laughs> and, and, you know, eat it in the street. And, uh stay busy all day. And at the end of the day, the guy would sit there and say, great job. Okay. You know, fill out your paperwork and I would go home. And so it, there was a lot of, uh, sort of classic having the movie experience back in the day. I got very, very lucky that it was a time when things were simpler and there was a lot of work going on and that sort of classic, um, Hollywood system was still working, right. um, you know, uh, because after, after I did hook an army of darkness, I got on, um, Francis Ford Coppola's Dracula. Oh, cool. Uh, and that was, that was, you know, they were all amazing movies to work on because they were big studio pictures and they were all done in giant sound stages with tons of movie stars. And, you know, those were the, those were the days when you didn't have two movie stars in a film. You had six, right. um, and so coming on to set my first day on Dracula and there's Anthony Hopkins sitting in a chair and I'm like stupefied and I'm kind of standing there in front of him trying not to stare. And he sort of looks up from his book and says, hello, dear boy, don't mind me. I'm just doing some light reading. And he lifted the book and it was War and Peace. Of course, dear boy. Yeah. He, he exactly, had an Archie you know, comic book in there. <laughs> Exactly. And, and so, uh, again, I got, I was very fortunate so many times to be in the right time in, in the right place at the right time, uh, to have these experiences. Um, you know, I missed stunt doubling Gary Oldman by inches. Uh -huh. Um, uh, I had been brought on set to play a different character. I was supposed to be one of the Romanian knights and the head of makeup freaked out 
and grabbed me and took pictures of me and grabbed me by the neck and said, don't move, ran over and got the stunt coordinator, brought the stunt coordinator back and goes, who the hell does this remind you of? And the stunt coordinator was Billy Burton, was a very, very famous sort of old school cowboy stunt coordinator, went, oh, damn, if you don't look like him. I didn't know who they were talking about. All of a sudden, it turns out that I look exactly like Gary Oldman, <laughs> because at that time, I was very lean. I had long hair and a beard, and uh, they just sat there and said, my God, you're an amazing double for Gary. And I was getting all excited and everything, and all at the last minute, Billy goes, you would be a good double for him. You'd be an amazing double for him, but I don't have anything for you to do, because there was going to be this giant sword battle between the Romanians and the Turks, and they just turned it all into shadow puppets. Uh, oh, I remember that. Yeah, uh. and I'm sitting there going, you mean to tell me if I'd been here days earlier that you guys would have gone, hey, we've got a double for Gary now. We can do this whole battle. Uh. And uh, so, you know, it didn't come to pass. I stayed on the movie um, as one of the Romanian knights in the in the church sequence and got to be there for a big chunk of the movie. And um, again, you know, another bucket list, amazing experience. And um it, it just sort of rolled along like that. Uh, you know, I, I got bigger jobs, more responsibility. I got known in the industry for, I got known in the industry for doing a lot of the Hong Kong style fighting and a lot of the oh, Japanese yeah, like and type reactions. And so I was one of the only Caucasian kids in Hollywood at that time where everybody would call up and go, you can do all that Hong Kong flippy crash into the wall stuff. And I'd say, yeah. And they'd hire me. Um, so I was one of about three people that could do it in town. So I was working left and right. I was working all week long. I was getting called by TV shows and things. And, um, you know, I was the perfect bad guy. I had stringy long hair and, you know, always looked like a thug. And so, you know, I, I'd walk into the hair and makeup room and they'd go, you look perfect. You look like a bad guy. You don't <laughs> yeah. need to do anything to you. We're not going to waste any makeup money on this guy. Exactly. It's like, oh, you look scary. Just go be in the movie. How did you, how did your, I, I, excuse me for interrupting here. How did your, um, the way you sort of adapted your martial arts for camera, how did that affect your training in martial arts? Did you have to work extra hard to, you know what I mean? It almost seems like uh, two different systems after a while. I'll tell you a funny tidbit. It didn't affect most of my martial arts ever because I was able to mentally separate the two things. I was able to sit there and go, this is a movie. Mm -hmm. This is your training. But the one time after a number of years, the one thing I found um, was that I hadn't been keeping up my actual fencing. So sparring with swords and, and actually sword fighting, I hadn't kept that up. I'd still been using swords and I'd still had a discipline and I was still training with swords and swordsmanship, but I hadn't actually fenced people in a while. Mm -hmm. And I'd been doing so much movie sword fighting that I go back in and I meet up with some other uh, um, fellow swordsmen and they want to sit there and say, hey, let's have you know a couple of rounds of fencing. And so we all get geared up and we put our fencing jackets on and our masks and everything. Um, I suddenly find that in a fencing match with someone, we're, we're, we're fencing saber and all of my attacks are falling short. So I'm missing hitting him by an inch and he's hitting me all the time. And they start making fun of me. And then it dawns on them. They're like, my God, you're doing movie sword play. You can't do that. <laughs> you're supposed to be hitting us. And then it dawns on me that it's been trained into me so much. having to work with actors and movie stars. Don't hit them. Don't hit them. Don't hit them. That I've got this, conditioned response now of looking great while I'm using a sword, but I'm constantly missing everybody by an inch. <laughs> and I got raked over the coals for it and, and had a really bad day fencing because I lost every match. Uh, and it, 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 it dawned on me, okay, if you really still do love this, you've got to separate the two and you've got to train both. You know, I had always done things where, I trained everything ambidextrously, so I did everything left and right-handed, um, which came in very handy for films because every once in a while we had a left-handed actor. 
So any, any weapon that I used, whether it was a rapier or a small sword or a long sword or anything, I trained everything right and left hand. So I would be profi proficient in both hands. Um, but I literally had to retrain myself to separate sparring and fencing from movie sword work so that when I was doing one, I could bring myself out of it and go back into the other. That's amazing. That's, that's just pure conditioning over time. And, and that's the same conditioning that got you to be an excellent swordsman in the first place. So it's all there inside you, but it's, it's interesting how you practice something long enough. That's what comes first. And then you realize, wait, I got to turn it on on this guy. He's my friend, but he's not Brad Pitt. I can hit him. Right, exactly. So how did Cold Steel come into the picture for you? And and actually designing knives and weapons, you have this rich education in historical weaponry, um, you know, through your Met connections, which is just so enviable, uh, admirable and uh, amazing. And then through all the historical swordsmanship you've done, uh, be it HEMA or Japanese swordsmanship, um, how did Cold Steel come along and how did you get into actually designing knives it's, and swords? It's, it's interesting. Um, I got approached by uh, a fellow sword choreographer who had been in the industry a long, long time, was a super proficient uh, swordsman himself, a gentleman by the name of Anthony Delanges. And Anthony and I had been friends for years. And Anthony said, hey, um, I work with the president of Cold Steel, Lynn Thompson, and he's interested in training in Japanese swordsmanship. He really wants an instructor in Japanese swordsmanship. And so I said, oh, OK, I'm, I'm happy to meet him. And this was a long time ago. Oh my God, this was probably... I don't even know. It might have been 2002, 2003. And um, I met, uh, I went up to Ventura and I met Lynn. And it, it was a, it was a great first meeting. Um, Lynn, Lynn's always had a, a larger than life personality. And Lynn, Lynn is a sort of American tycoon, that sort of, uh, uh, you know, industrialist, the guy who, you know, forged his own career out of his own hands. You know, Lynn had, Lynn had started, you know, Cold Steel entirely by himself. And he was that sort of Americana, I built this steel mill with my bare hands. And, you know, and I really respected that about him. I really did. I liked, I liked him right away. I said, I like this guy. He's, he's big, he's brash, he's bold. I like him. And uh, we wound up hitting it off right away. And so I started on a regular basis um, training Lin in Japanese swordsmanship. And Lin had already been studying martial arts and, and, and sword play for decades um, under, you know, with Anthony and under people like Guru Ron Balicki. Um, he had done dozens and dozens of seminars. Um, Lin was already very proficient. So he picked up a lot of the training lightning fast. And we made a lot of progress very quickly. And uh, before I knew it, um, because Lynn and I kind of saw eye to eye and we were we were kindred spirits, we were kind of of the same mind, you know, I was a good fit for the Cold Steel family. And so being part of the Cold Steel crew, I kind of fit in. So, um, you know, there were a lot of other, uh, of, uh, other guys who worked at the company and um, uh, they razzed me a lot in the beginning, but um, they saw that we were all like-minded. You know, you're either a, a good fit or you're not because Cold Steel is not an easy place at all. Cold Steel is very kind of, you know, rough and tumble and bark orders and you got to work hard and you got to get it done because it's a very, it was always a very, very serious business. And... Cold Steel got things done through the effort of how hard everybody worked because the amount of stuff that got put out of Cold Steel didn't match the people that we had. Cold Steel, you know, we didn't have, you know, 60 employees. Um, you know, we had probably, you know, 15 guys that did the majority of the work wow. in terms of stuff in the warehouse 
and shipments coming in and having to quality control and inspect and go through things. And um, I remember when I did my first um, Cold Steel video and, you know, I, I was just like a kid in a candy store. Um, you know, when we did the, the first, we when I was in my first proof video, um, we had a lot of people come in. We had, you know, guest people come in and it was a little odd because people would come in and stand around and kind of, you know, want to be treated like dilettantes. Mm -hmm. And, you know, um, I was one of the ones who I got in there and, you know, while I was there, I was like going, oh, do you need help with that box? Do you need help moving this? Let me go lift that. What are you guys doing? What can I help with? So I'm back in the warehouse prepping things, moving stuff and helping the rest of the guys do all the stuff for the video behind the scenes. And that also got back to Lynn. And the guy said, hey, you know, this guy's really cool. He's not being a dilettante. He's not standing around going, where's my coffee? And oh, yeah, I'll cut something in a minute. He's actually helping us out all day working. And that got back to Lynn. And I wound up becoming friends, very close friends with, with all the guys at Cold Steel. And it just wound up sort of steamrolling from there. You know, I, I wound up working at the company. Um, and it was very odd because I was working at the company part time while I was still doing film work. Hmm. So I'm still doing movie stuff. But in between, I would get a call and, you know, Cold Steel would call and say, hey, can you work this week? I would say, yeah. And I'd go into the warehouse and, you know, sort knives and do quality control and, you know, and, and resort things in the warehouse and lift giant boxes of knives and strain and get laughed at and, and you know, do everything I could to help out and then go home and then either come back to Cold Steel or wind up working on a film. Um, it just slowly progressed like that until I was working at Cold Steel all the time when I wasn't doing film work. So when I wasn't working on movies, when I had a dry spell or when, you know, people, movies were in development, I wound up being up at Cold Steel all the time. And if I wasn't training Lynn, Lynn and I were just going off the rails talking about knives and swords mm. constantly. Nice you know. work if you can get it. Yeah. And, and you know, we would, we would ramble on about, you know, swords. And Lynn loved how much information I had. Lynn was like, my God, you're like an encyclopedia when it comes to blade and weapons. So Lynn was perfectly happy to ask me 50 million questions all throughout the day. You know, Lynn and I would spend lunch hours together. Um, there were plenty of times when I got razzed in the warehouse because I wasn't working because I was up in Lynn's office and we were spending four and a half hours talking about swords and knives. And we started talking about sword designs. We started talking about, you know, designing pieces. and We started discussing, uh, you know, he started asking me, well, what does Cold Steel not have? You know, I know we have this and this, but I'm looking at expanding the sword line. And so we would put our heads together and talk about what swords might be popular amongst Cold Steel fans. What do we want to make that people will buy? We don't want to make something that nobody's going to buy and go, yeah, I know you guys made that, but I didn't like it and I didn't buy one. So we spent hours and hours and hours talking about what we thought would, and, and Lynn was a genius at this. He built up the entire company. So every once in a while I'd get hot on something and start talking about a specific thing. And he would go, yeah, but that's going to be a pain to manufacture. I know that's a cool weapon. I like it too, but I know for a fact, that I can't make that and I won't be able to sell it for under eight or $900. And that's not going to sell. So even though it's awesome, even though you and I both love it, that's not a marketable piece. And I would listen to him and I'd say, look, you're the guy who knows, not me. You know, I'm listening to everything you're telling me and I'm learning as I go, but you know, I get it. And so, um, it, it, we wound up cold steel wound up, working towards expanding the line ever further in terms of, you know, 
Lynn always had new knife models every year, but there was a period where we really started to push and try to come out with a lot more new products. Mm -hmm. And that was when, uh, you know, we really sat down and started to try and knock our heads together about new swords uh, and, and new knives. Um, I, I didn't have the knowledge that Lynn had about knife production and knife design. Um, I would design knives or I would do drawings for Lynn. Lynn is very specifically picky about his knives. So there were tons of times and I'd bring in 20 drawings and he would sit there and go, that's cool. But no, I like that. I don't like this. That's cool. But you got to change this. That handle looks like it's going to be uncomfortable. No, no, don't like it. Don't like it. Don't like it. And then I learned very quickly. I was like, okay, I don't really think that I'm going to push knife designs with Lynn because I, I have, I still have a lot to learn. Mm -hmm. So I, I stuck to swords. I stuck to swords because I knew what I knew about swords and I had pages and pages and pages of answers. So if he asked me about something, I could give him the history behind it. I could tell him how it was used. I could tell him how it could be marketable. I could tell him, look, I'm a sword nerd. I bought hundreds of swords. I know what sword guys like. I may not know, you know, the whole industry and I may not know pocket knives, but I know what people look for when they want to buy a sword. If they're going to spend a certain amount of money and they want a sword and that sword feels special to them, I know what it is that they're going to look for. I know what they appreciate when they open the box. So it steamrolled from there. And I started, uh, you know, working with Lynn on designing new pieces for the lineup. And it, it sort of steamrolled from there where in between my doing quality inspections on the swords, we would sit down and start talking about designs. Um, I worked with him on the plastic bokens mm -hmm. when the plastic bokens came out. We, we sat down and, and really put our heads together over the Oboken because, you know, the Oboken, which wound up being very, very popular when we sold millions of them. Um, that was something else that, that when we looked at it, I said, look, it's, it's gotta be bigger and heftier, but we still have to be able to use it. We're not making, we're not making a super Edo. We're not making a big heavy training weapon. We're just making an Oboken. We're making something larger for people to train with, but also for bigger guys to use. Okay. Yeah. I was just going to say a Boken is traditionally a wooden samurai sword, right? Or a wooden yeah. um, <clears throat> katana that you practice with, but cold steel has done a lot of great stuff with polypropylene or, or yeah. various really intense plastics and made these clubs and walking sticks. I, I have, I do myself have an absolutely epic cold steel collection. Uh, I've been a fan since about 88 or 87 when I first learned of the master Tanto and saved up my shekels. Oh yeah. I went to the Randall park mall, which no longer exists, went to Remington and bought that, that thing. And it's been next to my bed ever since to this day, my, uh, so I, I dig, uh, I really like the stuff they do uh, because the stuff that you do uh, because it's historically based. You can tell that there's a real love of historical weaponry there. Uh, even in the pocket knives, it's apparent, you know, um, and not just Japanese, but also, you know, well, just from all around the world. Does does uh, Lynn Thompson have some sort of a sprawling collection of swords and knives? Oh God, Lynn, Lynn has got, a God level collection of knives, swords. Lynn is also a firearms enthusiast. Lynn, mm -hmm. Lynn is an absolute dead eye shot. Um, literally when you, when you ever get the pleasure of watching Lynn point shoot, it's like watching an old cowboy film. It's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. Lynn hits what he aims at. So if we put bottles or little ping pong balls and things all over and he just nails everything. It's literally like watching one of the cowboy heroes in the 1930s is just ridiculous. Wow. Um, but he does have a very vast collection and he does have what um, used to be called his prototype rooms where he would collect ideas. So he'd have two giant boxes filled with antique kukris. So, you know, you'd, you pull these boxes out, there'd be 120 kukris in there 
uh, from all different ranges of, of time. And you know, you'd open another one and he'd have stilettos and Italian folding knives and Navajas and, you know, uh, other, you know, custom one-off made knives. Um, and, you know, he would study all these things and say, this thing has merit. This doesn't, this is something that can be brought back. Um, he, he really knew a lot about the history of knives and he, he had an amazing, you know, an amazing collection and his collection is smaller now because he just doesn't have anywhere to put all the stuff. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, you know, an amazing collection and, um, you know, impressive in terms of the array of things that he had. And like I said, he, he eventually, um, whittled it down because it had to, it had to fit within a realistic space of eventually when he didn't have the warehouse, he didn't have the two giant warehouses. It was a lot of stuff. Yeah. So we had to kind of compress and, 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 you know, I know Lynn sold a bunch of his stuff off at the parking lot sales and then, um, but he kept a lot of things and, and I was responsible for it. God, I bought him like, uh, God, I bought him, I don't know, five or 10 different antique swords um, you know, I got lucky enough that most of them had the scabbards with them. Oh, nice. Um, I got him an antique, the, the old uh, dragon head cane, the polypropylene. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cane. yeah. I found that cane for him in real, like, Malaysian hardwood with sterling silver fittings on it. It was a black cane, and it had all the stuff. Now, he had already made the prototype dragon cane of polypropylene. But I suddenly found this real one that was all sculpted. It looked 98% like the one he made. And I gave it to him as a, as a present. And uh, he still has it today. Um, but it was just, it was ridiculous because I was squabbling with somebody over it because I had found it and was talking to the owner about buying it. And this other person just came in and was trying to outbid me. For it. <laughs> you know. And I just kind of sat there and said, I got to tell you something, buddy, you're not going to win this because this is really special and it's something that has meaning and it's got a direct connection. So this isn't something I'm going to lose, you know, I'm not going to lose this. So no matter what you do. And I wound up, you know, I won it and uh, I gave it to Lynn. He still has it. You designed a sword for Cold Steel, and I believe it was in the Man Man of Arms line, uh, called the Sword of War, I believe. Yes. So this thing is beautiful, and I, I was studying it today, and it, it seems to really distill out uh, uh, some of the best qualities of a number of historical European swords. Tell me about the, that design in particular and, and what went in what went into its creation? Um, Lynn had talked to me and said, blatantly just said, design a sword. I want to make a, a Luke LaFontaine designed sword. Not help me design something. I want you to have something that's your signature, that you put your name on, that's your sword. I said, okay. And I went away and I thought long and hard. And I thought about doing a Japanese katana and I went, nah, that's that's too obvious. And so I remembered that, that, you know, there were, they, I had a love for HEMA. I had a love for European weapons and I started thinking through and I said, well, I love rapiers. I love rapiers. I, I've got, God, I have 60 or 70 rapiers in my collection, but wow. a rapier is not something that is necessarily going to commercially sell because it's kind of a niche sword and it's something for a specific swordsman. And so I started thinking, let's think long sword. Let's think 14th, 15th century. Let's stay in there. And I started looking and I looked through a lot of my books and I went, wait a minute. What about a complex hilted long sword or a sword of war? Um, they come in all different shapes and sizes. I can combine whatever I want to design a piece that will be my signature piece, but will still reflect plenty of historical models of swords from that period. 
So I set about coming up with a hilt design and I chose a classic two ring swept hilt design. And I went even further to pick the counter guards that are on Thibaut's sample of a rapier. Um, and they are interlinking knots that curve out from the arms of the hilt. The centers touch, and then they curve back into the arms of the hilt. And sword nerds know these counter guards, and they they attribute them to Thibaut's rapier, but they've been on other swords. It's a it's a style of counter guard. So I, I finished designing this hilt with long quillions, and um, I wanted the centers of the ring guards to flare. I wanted the, the hilt to have a sort of German Flemish uh, <laughs> feel to it. So a, a little bit of a Saxon sword as well, where the ends of the quillions flared mm -hmm. and uh, ended in points. And I wanted it to sort of have almost a gothic look to it. And that was kind of when we decided on the all black and the man at arms series. Um, as well as when I did the pummel, the pummel is sort of an amalgamation. It's, it's fairly historical, but at the same time, not, um, most or a lot of pummels had buttons on the end. And you'll notice mine doesn't because in my mind, you're using it as a weapon. So uh, the pummel as much as a weapon as the cross guard is, is the blade on a sword. So I designed the pummel to have this nasty pointed look to it. Um, but I had compiled this out of three or four different period long swords. And the sword had a different set of proportions to it. And I looked at it and I said, you know, this isn't, I wouldn't really call this a long sword. It is, but it isn't. It's more like an in-between sized sword of war. And a sword of war is a in-between sized sword that's a little bit heftier, a little bit beefier. It doesn't have all of the very, very, very graceful lines that a long sword does. When you look at Germanic long swords, and you get into the 14th, 15th century, um, the point becomes the main weapon of the sword. You do a lot less cutting. There's much more point work. There's a lot more half sorting. So the entire shape of the blade changes. And I had looked at my sword and I went, this isn't what I would call a classic long sword. It's beefier, it's heftier. I'd say that this is a combination of a Germanic longsword and a heftier sword of war with a complex guard on it. And I continued and went along that line because I thought to myself, it's a little bit more individualistic now. It's something that I've designed. People that really want to try and nitpick it can, but at the same time they can't because it's one of those things where it's like, well, every aspect of the sword is historical. So we can't say this sword didn't exist and we can open books up and find swords that look almost identical like that. So it, it was, you know, a piece that when it was all said and done, and the great thing was I had the prototype built by Dave Baker of Fire oh, cool. fame. Yeah. Dave built the prototype and he'd hand it to me and I'd move it around and I'd go take more weight out of the blade and I'd hand it back to him. And he'd work on it more and he'd hand it back to me and I'd move it around and I'd be like, take more weight out of the blade. <laughs> and Dave, bless his heart, just ground that thing to a piece of art. You know, he really, he kept the spine strong. So the center of the blade was really strong and stiff, but he just ground it away so that, you know, the sword, the prototype La Fontaine's Sword of War was really only about, it was under three and three quarter pounds. Wow. For a sword that size. Yeah. It was just <clears throat> under three and three quarter pounds. And it was very light and very fast in the hand. But the blade was stiff, but you could fight with it. 
you know, I moved that sword around. And I said, okay, people in HEMA will appreciate this because you can fight with this sword. This is not a big clunker to hang on your wall because I don't want to make that. And, you know, we brought it into Lynn and Lynn was like, wow, you know, and he liked it and he picked it up and he saw its merits immediately. So, wow, this has got a guard on it. Protect your hands. You can sword fight. But I'm not going to chop your hands apart. He sat there and he goes, you know what, crap, this thing moves around really well for a sword this size. The only thing that Lynn was never a fan of was the pummel. Lynn was just like, I don't like this thing. It pokes me. Why do you got it so pointy on the end? And then I turned it on. I said, Lynn, pummel smash. And he went, oh, okay, great. I love it. Anytime <laughs> you showed what violence that part of the sword did, then Lynn loved it. So um, the, the, the sword, you know, went into production and um, it, it, it was, you know, it, I was really, really proud of it. Um, initially, it took a lot to catch on. And I got given a lot of grief about that, which I had to just take. Um, because in my overthinking, trying to think about how to market the sword, I wasn't marketing the sword. Um, I was sitting there and going... Oh, I, I got to come up with something for this. I know I'll do a demo. I'll get a bunch of HEMA guys. We'll, we'll, we'll do all of this in, you know, synchronized cutting. And I had all these great ideas. And then the sword started to pick up on its own. People started to buy it. It started to get reviews. Um, the, the one thing that was a little bit disheartening was this, the production model came out heavier. It came out heavier than I wanted. And, uh, you know, you're always lambasted and cursed and, 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 you know, dragged through the dirt in terms of everything about the sword. If there's something wrong with it, it's your fault. So, um, you know, I had a hard time in the beginning in the HEMA community trying to explain, look, I didn't want the sword to come out at this weight. It should be, you know, you know, two thirds of a pound lighter, mm -hmm. but not all the swords are this heavy. I found light ones that were very stiff and fast. And I brought those into a number of HEMA guys and said, handle this. And they went, wow, this is great. I said, yes, but you understand it's a production sword. We make a thousand of them. We don't make 10. Right, so, right. you know, that if must... we were going to have the quality control, it would take, you know, six years to make one sword. That must have been especially painful um, to have the heavy sword, especially after you and Dave Baker worked on getting the you know dialing in the weight just so but like you said you're making a thousand of these things and they're swords it's not like you're making a thousand slip joint pocket knives they're big swords and you know each one is going to probably be ground slightly differently and every everything's going to be a little bit different on each one um but i i think that whole um man of war uh, series was pretty cool taking some of the some of the swords and and uh halberds and staff weapons and making them black <laughs> i thought that was pretty cool and yeah it does add a gothic look definitely to your sword which already has that feel just from its from its profile uh, uh in closing what what sword if you if you could design another sword or when you design another sword what's what kind of considerations would you look for uh in another in another weapon um I've got a sword in mind. It's under wraps. We're we're going to see if it goes or not. But um, uh, in taking consideration, uh, I've got to take into consideration of what people are going to be interested in. Um, is the majority of the audience going to appreciate the merits of the sword? Um, be, from the aesthetics to how it handles, to how it performs, to where it lays in history. Um, you have to take all of these things in consideration when you're doing this because, again, in the end, it's a product. And the same way you design a race car, you design a race car, and it's got to be pleasing, but the damn thing's got to win races. So in the same way when you have to design a sword, as much as you find things that you personally are enamored with in terms of the performance and the history and your love of a particular weapon, you have to pay attention to the general audience. You have to pay attention to sword fans. 
And I have to say, sword fans fall in love with some ugly swords. <laughs> they just do. And you have to go with it. You've got to sit there and go, well, you can't fight that. They like this sword. And I sit there and I look, I'm like, God, it's one of the ugliest ass swords in history. Why the hell? Yeah, I know it cuts well, but most swords cut well. And I'll look <laughs> at this thing and be like, oh my God, they're selling thousands of these and I can't stand it. It's just an ugly big, you know, but it, people have their own connections to weapons in history. And a lot of things have to come into play. How did it perform in history? Who used it? What time period was it in? Um, does it have a very significant role in the history of the development of swords? Uh, was it used in a number of wars? Um, you know, is it a real practical sword? A lot of swords, where they sit there and go, that is a practical sword. It cuts well. It handles well. It does, it's just aesthetically kind of eh. But lots of things are. Mm -hmm. There are plenty of things. You know, there are tons of revolvers all throughout history that performed perfectly, but they're eh to look at. Yeah, that's that's what the Messer is to me. I love the classic, you know, German Messer um, in its utility. But it's just kind of eh looking. But, but it's that. Uh, it's that quality that lends to what it is. It's a hearth knife. It's, you know, it's a weapon. It's for splitting logs. It's for, you know, all sorts of things, hunting this and that. Um, but it's not necessarily getting your heart racing extra fast with how it looks. Right. And, and primarily it's mainly because it's a big knife. It's yeah. literally technically not a sword because historically sword cutlers made swords. So when people were making messers, messers came out of, I'm a blacksmith. I'm not part of the sword cutlers guild. I'm not allowed to make swords, but I can make this big knife. Yeah. <laughs> because technically this isn't a sword. How about so that? When you look at how a messers constructed, it's a big knife. So, Sword cutlers and people that were making hundred thousand dollar swords for princes and kings and whatnot couldn't complain. They couldn't go to the guild. They couldn't go to the town magistrate or whoever in the hell they were going to go to and say, "Hey, this guy's taking my business and doing something that he doesn't have any right to do." And they'd go, "No, he made a big knife. He didn't make a sword. This doesn't have the fine quality craftsmanship that your swords do. It's just yeah. a big knife." And then the guy's going, yeah, but I'm mad because people are buying it. Well, tough. This guy's made a really great utilitarian large knife. He's put slab handles on it. It's got an exposed tang. It's got rivets going all the way through the handle, just like a knife. Mm -hmm. um, it's single-edged. It's, you know, uh, everything about it is technically it's a large knife. So sword cutlers had no place to complain about it. That's and cool. The practicality of it spoke for itself. You know, you look at a messer in, in warfare, in civilian use, the messer just made sense. You know, it's like the precursor to the cutlass. It's basically within the cutlass family. And when you talk about the cutlass or the cutto or, you know, the, the, the beginnings of the cutlass and you talk about dusogs and things like that, the, the, the messer and the storta they're all slightly linked in that you've got the single hand cutting sword that delivers a wallop and it became so popular that they developed fighting systems on how to use it. Luke, we're, we're going to continue this conversation uh, uh, in a short conversation for the patrons. Uh, I could talk to you all week about historical weapons um, and I'm, I'm fascinated always have been by this topic. Uh, thank you so much for coming on the show and, uh, and sharing your experiences with us. I, I know we all appreciate it and uh, I hope to talk to you real soon. Great. Thank you for having me. I had a great time. Thank you for letting me share my tidbits. <laughs> oh, it's been a pleasure. Take care, Luke. Do you use terms like handle the blade ratio, walk and talk, hair pop and sharp or tank like, then you are a dork and a knife junkie. 
Luke LaFontaine living the dream and growing up in the Met Sword Department, uh, where I whiled away many an afternoon uh, years ago. Such beautiful work there. It was really cool to uh, to learn about about his career, but also about his uh, the the mastery that goes into designing a sword and all the elements. We talk a lot about knives, especially a lot about folding knives, uh, and we know what uh, what we like there, but we forget that there are sword junkies and that they have their uh, very particular tastes and desires as well. Uh, speaking of which, join us here uh, this coming Wednesday for the midweek supplemental and then Thursday night for Thursday night knives, 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time here live. And uh, and then we'll see you again next Sunday for another great interview. Thanks again for joining us here on the Knife Junkie podcast. For Jim working his magic behind the switcher, I'm Bob DeMarco saying, until next time, don't take dull for an answer. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at the knifejunkie.com or call our 24 7 listener line at 724 466 4487 and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the knife junkie podcast